Welcome everybody and thank you for being here. This is one of the kickoff events for our 2017 to 2018 week of sustainability here at St. Ben's and St. John's. My name is Alyssa Brown, I'm the CSB Sustainability Coordinator. Um, I did want to briefly mention, you'll see in the back of the room, there's an opportunity to share feedback as we prepare to launch into the planning process for our new sustainability plan, Sustainability Directions 2020. If you get a minute after this event and you want to jot down your thoughts, please feel free to do so. And again, I'm so happy that we're here tonight together and really want to thank the J. Phillips Center for Interfaith Learning um, for hosting this event. And here's John Merkel, the director of the J. Phillips Center. Thank you, Alyssa. I was really uh, very grateful and delighted can you all hear me back there? Is this coming in nicely? Good, thanks. When uh, Alyssa approached me about creating an event sponsored by the J. Phillips Center for Interfaith Learning during Sustainability Week, and I thought immediately of the person that I wanted to do this, um, St. John's graduate from 1994, Sam Thomas, who's our distinguished guest today. Uh, first, I just want to mention um, that I'm also really delighted to be um, working with wonderful student workers, Donica Simonet here, and um, with Abdirzak Jama back there. I think many of you probably know both of them. And next semester, when she returns from uh, study abroad in uh, Ghana, it'll be the date Lowy working with us again as she did last year. And um, I really appreciate all the work they're doing. I want to uh, tell you that um, you can always, of course, come directly to me, but you can also go directly to them about any interests and concerns you have uh, about interfaith relations or interfaith study. And we're in the process of setting up some really wonderful group discussions for the next semester, and uh, we invite you to, to participate. So you'll be seeing uh, notices about that. But in any case, Sam Thomas, thank you so much for accepting this invitation. You know, Sam was a biology major here, and then he went on to study theology at Yale and at uh, the University of no at, and, at, uh, Notre Dame, where he received his MDiv degree at Yale, and then his PhD at Notre Dame. And his focus was early Judaism and early Christianity. But over the course of his teaching, he has not only continued to teach courses in those areas, but he has developed a great interest in teaching courses, well, in studying and in teaching courses and writing about uh, ecological, environmental in, um, issues. So he works in the field of uh, sustainability and teaches courses there at where he's been a professor now for is it 12 years at uh, California Lutheran University uh, he teaches courses not only in Judaism and Christianity and interreligious relations but courses in um, sustainability and also in uh, on religion and food and I noticed that um, you're also part of a slow food Ventura County movement, right? So on the board there. Um, and he's written a, a number of articles in, in the various areas I've just mentioned. So he comes to us with a lot of expertise. And he not only knows a tremendous amount about Judaism and Christianity, but he knows a good amount about other religions as well. And so today's talk, he's dealing with, are you going to deal with five religious traditions? OK. In, yeah, in 45 minutes, right? It's my fault. I'm really happy to welcome Sam, and I'm grateful you're here. Thanks. Thank you so much, John. Uh, can you hear me okay? It's good. Is this it's working? It's live? Okay. Well, this is really, um, it's really wonderful to be here. I was wondering if maybe we could get the podium a little a little farther over to the right. Um, is, that, is that possible today? Um, Kidding. I am going to kind of hang out over here. I might drift around a little bit, but um, but I'll, I'll stay. I'll stay somewhat close to my notes here. But um, 
I wanted to start actually today by just mentioning a couple other special guests. There are a lot of special guests in this room, many people that I've known for a long time and I'm also new friends. But I also wanted to just kind of mention a couple people who are um, very special to me who also just came from California recently. They're actually two of my former students at Cal Lutheran um, who are now seminarians at Luther Seminary, um, Cole and Amanda, who drove up to, to be with us today. And um, they've actually both taken my, um, my what's now called religion and ecological ethics, what at the time was called environmental ethics. So I hope, I hope there's some new material here. Um, and they can also tell you whether, uh, whether I actually know what I'm talking about or not. Um, so it really is an honor to be here and to return to, um, to, to Collegeville and to St. Joseph, to be among friends, old friends and new friends. Um, it really was here that I, for the first time, had um, meaningful encounters with forests and lakes and deer and beavers and salamanders and muskrats and indigo buntings and frogs and mosquitoes and horse flies and, of course, that other local species, monks and nuns. It was here that I studied ecology as a biology major, learning hundreds of birds with Norm Ford and I think probably millions of plants with Nick Zakowski. Um, and actually, the, the truth is that I, I didn't learn all of the birds. Um, I'll never forget getting one of my exams back from Dr. Ford, who was sort of notoriously challenging as a, as a professor. And um, one of those exams in the margins in red pen, it just said, like at various places, it said, no. And why? And right, and thinking like, okay, well, maybe, maybe like ecology is not really my uh, my forte. No, I'm kidding. Um, so I ended up not going into the sciences for a variety of reasons. Um, and at the time, you know, I, I thought their obsessions were a little bit strange. Um, I thought I was headed to medical school, but it really was in the St. John's Woods that um, that that school of love where nature first came alive to me. And I first came alive to its dazzling delights. It was here that I first encountered religion, too, in the life and the spirit of the place, and also in the academic study of religion, which I experienced as, as open and inviting and intriguing. I didn't know it at the time, but in the course of my life, these would eventually merge into these two emergence, this emergence of religion and ecology. And it turns out that there's a whole field of study called religion and ecology um, that brings these two fields of knowledge together. It turns out actually that also that um, one of the founders of that field of study in recent decades um, is a guy named John Grimm, who is also an alumnus of St. John's, I think from, I want to say from the 50s, maybe the 1950s or 60s. Um, so the timing of today's talk, your sustainability week, is salient. On Friday, a draft of volume two of the National Climate Assessment was released for public comment, following up on volume one from 2014. The conclusions are not terribly surprising, though they are disturbing, finding that climate-induced disruptions are now and will continue to be worse than predicted in 2014. A New York Times reporter writes that the draft, quote, the draft report suggests a different approach to assessing the effects of climate change by considering how various impacts on food supplies, water, and electricity generation, for example, interact with each other. It's not possible to understand the full extent of climate-related impacts in the United States without considering these interactions, the report says. It gives several examples, including recent droughts in California and elsewhere, that in combination with population changes, affects demand for water and energy. The draft also cites Hurricane Sandy, five years ago, which caused cascading impacts on interconnected systems in the New York area, some of which had not been anticipated. Flooding of subway and highway tunnels, for example, made it more difficult to repair the electrical system, which suffered widespread damage. In other words, the report underscores the extent to which most institutions and municipalities are underprepared for climate disruption and the need to build adaptive strategies toward resilience. So in this talk, I'm placing multiple environmental discourses in conversation with one another. And first, I want to suggest that there's a growing movement in what I'm, what I'm calling secular discourse. By that, I, I, don't, I don't mean like non-religious. I, I just mean like institutions, um, nonprofits, government, et cetera. Um, but there's a growing movement in secular discourse from sustainability, 
talk of sustainability and sustainability practices toward resilience. I'm gonna talk about that, what, what I think that means. Um, this can be seen most obviously in the recent turn in higher education uh, from the Association of College and University Presidents climate commitment, formerly known as ACUPUC, um, to the sort of sustainability nerds in the room. Um, and this, this centered sustainability and was both driving and driven by its associations with sustainability groups, uh, committees, offices, departments, and, and, and the like, toward what is now called the second nature climate commitment, which largely subsumes sustainability language into resilience and adaptation as both strategies and thought worlds. So to some extent, the conceptual contents of resilience borrow from the disciplines of ecology and the social sciences, particularly psychology and urban studies. Let me see if I can get my slides to go here. Um, ecological resistance being defined as the capacity of an ecosystem to return to the preconditioned state following a perturbation, including maintaining its essential characteristics of taxonomic composition, structures, ecosystem functions, and process rates. So that's a, that's a, you know, a, a, a scientific definition of ecological resilience, um, noting, of course, the, both the, the fact of perturbations, in other words, disruptions to the system, and then also the ability of that system to, um, to, to sort of suffer those perturbations and then maintain their essential characteristics. So I assume that the second nature people, this is the, the people who are sort of behind the, um, this organization that is um, working with colleges and universities around the country, and I'm, I'm, I'm like a 99% sure that CSB, SJU is a signatory to that, to second nature, um, that what they mean by second nature is both the, right, um, that, that developing practices that are automatic and instinctive for the institution, right, become second nature, but also to indicate that we're living into a kind of second nature, um, a second period of nature that is distinct from an earlier one. The larger context for this shift toward resilience thinking is a growing recognition that we're now living in a new geological epoch known as the Anthropocene, or sometimes you'll hear Anthropocene, itself a contested term in the geological sciences, uh, but also a poignant one for what it suggests, that we are now living in a new geological time period in which there is perhaps no such thing as non-human nature, or in other words, that the Earth's ecosystems and geomorphic patterns have now been altered or will be altered by human presence and activity for the foreseeable future. So humans, in other words, as a constitutive um, agent in, right, in, uh, in ecological and in geological patterns. So if that's the case, and again, I said that's a contested term, although I don't think the reality that it tries to point to is contested among scientists and among observers who are paying close attention, it goes without saying that we should take great care with how we proceed. So my title and description for this talk uh, is maybe a little bit polemical. I don't, I don't mean to suggest that, um, that sustainability is obsolete as a set of practices um, or concepts or that it's entirely distinct from resilience. Sustainability is often focused on supporting actions that can perpetuate without rendering the future less prosperous overall. That's a kind of typical definition of sustainability, um, economically, socially, environmentally. It's, of course, a perfectly legitimate set of concerns uh, and has been tremendously important, I think, for engaging institutional cultures and practices, not only around the country, but, but around the world, right, toward, toward more sustainable uh, kinds of um, thinking and action. But one criticism of sustainability as a model has been that it tends to presume a stable system to be sustained, <clears throat> excuse me, to be sustained over time, which is seldom the case, right? Um, another criticism is that sustainability has tended to operate especially in technocratic and somewhat paternalistic modes. That is, we understand the problems and the fixes, so we'll just take care of things. Resilience, by contrast, um, focuses on the capacity to operate in the context of change and disruption, overcoming problems in the short term and preparing for a different and continually changing future. To give an example um, that you can find on the Second Nature website if you're interested in this sort of thing, um, 
to give an example of rainwater collection, this is a good way to distinguish between something that's sustainable and something that's resilient. A sustainable practice, right, rainwater collection, um, in normal circumstances, it allows for using less irrigated water pumped in from some other location. But it's only sustainable in the context of normal rainfall patterns in which the collection barrels are filled up again and again. In the case of extreme drought, not that I know anything about that where I live in Southern California, uh, a resilient landscape would not only be watered by rainwater and rain barrel water, but it would also be able to withstand and even flourish in conditions of drought without irrigation because of careful attention to creating native plant communities that also host a variety of biota and are beautiful and can survive and thrive even in the case of drought. So by planting a native landscape, only, um, you know, not only have I conserved water, a sustainable practice, but I've also participated in bringing about a small system that is resilient and beautiful and also connected to the bioregion in which I live. I'm not, I mean, I, I happen to do that, but I'm just using, you know, using the first person if we all do that. So resilience thinking is predicated on diversity, redundancy, distributive patterns, and adaptability. I like the metaphor of a kind of meshwork um, of like interlaced strands or even rhizomic structures uh, come to mind, like this, this picture of, a, of the um, mycorrhizae, um, which is, if you're, if you're familiar with that, anybody know about that? This is, a, this, is, this is everywhere underground. It doesn't necessarily look like that, um, but, it be, but it's a great, it's a, it's a wonderful metaphor for thinking about, um, or for kind of capturing a sense of what, uh, what, what I mean and what other people mean by resilience um, as a, a set of kind of cooperative assemblages, um, or as one anthropologist calls it, multi-species world making, right? That, that in, in the, in the mycorrhizae itself is a cooperative assemblage. Um, of both fungus, fungal and plant material um, that, that work together and actually form the, the, very, the very ground of, um, of the possibility of resilience, not only resilience, but also uh, you know, flourishing of forest ecosystems. So resilience thinking starts with the recognition of the interconnectedness of things and processes within a system. So while both sustainability and resilience incorporate concern for nature, people, and development, or the three E's of ecosystem equity and economics, as it's all often known, a resilience mindset understands that planning and action must always include as many voices and concerns as possible, not only claim to represent them. And to a certain extent, resilience is patterned on local or regional, social, economic, and ecological relations. So for these, re for these reasons, resilience is not just the ability of a particular institution to do things like conserve resources and achieve greater efficiencies, uh, but it's measured by the degree to which an institution, like a college, is imbricated into the fabric of the larger social and environmental whole. And this is precisely, the, the, I think, the insight of the Second Nature Movement which is to insist that part of how institutions understand and practice resilience is assessed by the strength of community partnerships with municipal government, businesses, nonprofits, even prisons, hospitals, and Superfund sites, for that matter, by the extent of experiential and problem-based curriculum, and by robust attention to issues of economic and environmental justice. I feel, honestly, a little editorial aside here, I feel a little silly in some ways, speaking to this group at this school, um, at both St. John's and St. Ben's, about some of these, some of these things, because when I when I look at what's happening here, I actually I actually think this is a, this is a really good example of all these things. You're already doing them. You don't really need me to come and tell you um, that this is you know that this is how to build resilient communities. In some ways, um, the the Benedictine communities I think are a, are in many ways a beautiful example of um, of, of resiliency kinds of thinking and practice. So while sustainability has tended to focus more on management and mitigating practices such as recycling, waste reduction, conservation, efficiency, alternative energy, and so on, and less on comprehensive or holistic attitudes for why one might choose one set of practices over another, or for why a community or society may elect to organize itself 
according to an entirely different set of ethics and patterns. Sustainability tends to presume and work within, for the most part, here I'm hoping to provoke people a little bit, um, work within the context and general fitness of industrialized capital-based economies and political systems, while resilience may offer imaginative possibilities for new emergent social arrangements that are responsive to and shaped by particular ecosystemic situations. In other words, human nature assemblages not imposed on landscapes, as in the industrial imperial model, but rather the human nature assemblage itself gives rise to new political economies that are shaped and informed by bioregional context and capabilities. Something like this happening here already um, in, in, in the, in the St. Joseph area. You just kind of, um, you know, think about the, the local economy of craftspeople and farmers and tradespeople and small business owners and others who are, right, there is a kind of a cooperative assemblage, I think, taking shape in some interesting ways. So um, as I move toward the religion part of my talk, and, and as um, you heard me sort of joking with, uh, with John Merkel earlier, um, that, that's a tall order to talk about five different religions or relig you know, religious traditions in, this, in the time frame that I have. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but as I move into the religion part of my talk, I should be clear that I'm, like, I don't mean to suggest as I go forward that only religious traditions carry the language and practices to work toward resilience. That is, that, that secular ones do not. Uh, but they do, I think, have the advantage, or at least the possibility, of investing the world with a certain sacrality. That is an intrinsic kind of value connected with conceptions of the sacred that can motivate action. And they do have the advantage of hosting ritual practices that can animate those conceptions of the sacred through repetitive physical enactment. So I say can. They don't, they don't always do this, obviously. I'll give you an example. Uh, my colleague in, in my department at Cal Lutheran, Lisa Dayhill, um, who has done a lot on sort of ecological spirituality. She's written uh, some really wonderful things, and she asks about baptism. She says, you know, if we were in the habit of dunking our babies in the local waters, wouldn't we be concerned about the ecological integrity of those waters, right? Wouldn't the practice of dunking our babies in them help us to see them as sacred? Would we tolerate dunking our babies in the downriver effluvium of an industrial chemical plant or of agricultural runoff. But alas, this is not how most Christians practice baptism. But I think it strikes, it, it strikes to the point, right, um, about how, like, we can actually, we could actually marshal ritual practices in the direction of a more, uh, a more resilient uh, kind of being in the world. So, because I've been asked to talk about it, quite a few traditions in this talk, I don't have a hope of being thorough, and I run the risk of reduction, reducing these traditions at, to some kind of essential point. Um, and, and so uh, to try to kind of sidestep this danger, I'm simply going to place voices from these wide and complex traditions in conversation with each other with a little bit of commentary. Um, these voices speak to the question of how do we live in place and in relation to the life of the world around us. In the end, these voices speak a certain kind of ethics into being, an ethics of nonviolence and attention, an ethics that might inspire practices and attitudes of resilience, of relationality and cooperation. These voices invite us to understand more deeply the watersheds and the food sheds and the ecosystems in which we live and to understand them as also the contexts in and for which we might learn how to live. So on one level, religious and spiritual traditions are themselves, if they're still with us, resilient insofar as they have adapted over time to changing historical and cultural circumstances. Mahayana Buddhism, as it migrated from its origins in India toward China and Japan, itself developed a new emphasis on upaya, or skillful means, as a deep strategy of cultural adaptation. And Judaism has, at its core, because of historical experience, developed deep resilience as its adherents faced one kind of disruption and dislocation after another. 
And indigenous lifeways have proven perhaps the most resilient of all in the face of the relentless assaults on their ways of life, not only in the North American context, but around the world. So I'm going to talk about indigenous traditions as um, helping us see what it looks like to be in place. And this is a, um, a quotation from a group of, uh, of, of native elders um, who are also scholars, and they, 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 wrote, they were writing about um, indigenous, kind of indigenous ecology, indigenous knowledge. And they say this, that perhaps the closest one can get to describing unity in indigenous knowledge is that knowledge is the expression of the vibrant relationships between people, their ecosystems, and other living beings and spirits that share their lands. All aspects of knowledge are interrelated and cannot be separated from the traditional territories of the people concerned. To the indigenous ways of knowing, the self exists within a world that is subject to flux. Indigenous knowledge is the way of living within contexts of flux of paradox and tension. And so just to note here, again, the, 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 the focus on both um, peop, right, the interactions between people, their ecosystems, and other living beings, right, and this idea of being in place, but also being attentive to the ways in which right, um, that life is, is a, condition, a condition of being in flux. One of my favorite writers, um, and if you haven't come across her work, I, I highly, highly recommend her work, um, Robin Wall Kimmerer, who wrote an absolutely stunning book called Braiding Sweetgrass. And she's, a, she's an indigenous, she's a um, member of the Potawatomi tribe, and she um, is also a plant biologist and wrote a really beautiful book um, where she's trying to kind of put together both indigenous wisdom and, right, and insights from, from her field of plant biology. Um, and here she talks about um, the, the connection with, um, with land, right, and place, um, and engaging land not as a machine, but as a community of respected non-human persons. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold that up in a moment, because I think this is actually, I, I would argue, this, this remains one of the challenges for monotheistic traditions, which I'll talk about um, in a little bit, right, um, and the, the, um, the idea that there are uh, that there are such a thing as non-human persons. But this community of respected non-human persons to whom we humans have a responsibility. Restoration requires renewing the capacity not only for ecosystem services, uh, right? That is to say, things that are in the service of human beings, but for cultural service as well. Renewal of relationships includes water that you can swim in and not be afraid to touch. Restoring relationship means that when the eagles return, it will be safe for them to eat the fish. People want that for themselves too. Biocultural restoration raises the bar for environmental quality of the reference ecosystem so that as we care for the land, it can once again care for us. So note there, the, again, the, the emphasis on relationships, the emphasis on place, um, and, um, and on care with attention to the integrity and the, um, and the, right, the, uh, the humanness of, or the personhood of other beings. And then, and then finally, um, Winona LaDuke, who's a, a Minnesota-based activist, who anybody, I don't know if you're familiar with her. Yeah, right, we got some Winona LaDuke fans in the room. Nice, okay. Um, and uh, she is, she is um, well known for her, both for her writing and for her activism and is a member of the Anishinaabe tribe and um, up at, at uh, White Earth in northern Minnesota. And Winona LaDuke says, says this, right? If we're, if we're going to be talking about relationships and restoration and so on, um, we can't restore our relationship with the earth until we find our place in the world and ask that question, where, where is home? I'm absolutely sure, she says, our societies could live without yours. She's writing to, right, to, to, sort of Western white North Americans, maybe not white, but Western North Americans, she says, I'm absolutely sure our societies could live without yours, but I'm not so sure that your society can continue to live without ours. Of course, as a kind of charge, right, to learn from, um, from indigenous lifeways about what, 
what it looks like to live in place and also to develop the kind of, uh, the kind of resiliency that I think stems from a, an attitude of respect to the natural world and not an attitude of control and domination. I'm going to give one more quote, uh, which I think is actually provocative, too, from, um, from Vine Deloria, who is a famous uh, writer, Native American writer, um, and is a, an important voice, particularly in um, both environmental justice issues, but also, um, also in um, sort of cultural history. And he says, I'm not going to, I don't have a PowerPoint for it or a, a slide for it. He says that native tribes were particularly interested in trying to orient themselves to the behavior of the living beings already present on the land, trying to model their actions after the animals they saw around them, and by so doing, adapt themselves to the new landscape. In this respect, we see the Indian belief that humans are not the highest product of the creation or even of evolution. Instead, they fall short in many ways. They're not as fast as the four-leggeds, not able to fly like the birds not as keen of eye as the hawks or eagles, not as strong as the buffalo and bear. Because we were the last species created, according to Indian beliefs, humans were less well endowed than non-human animals. In the eyes of many tribes, we were the junior members of the land. And consequently, we needed to develop alliances with other beings that had been here longer and that possessed better physical attributes and had more wisdom than we. I hear here a nod toward the recognition of, the, of, of biodiversity, right, and of the adaptation that animals, right, that, that, the, that um, other members of an ecosystem have built up, right, over a, over a long period of time, and actually attempting not only to preserve that, but to learn from that. So that's the, that's, I'm, I'm thinking about that in terms of, like, being in place. I'm going to talk a little bit about, about Buddhism and about, um, particularly about um, a, a, I don't know if you know about Buddhism, but Buddhism is obviously a very wide, diverse, um, complex tradition with many different, um, many different expressions. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about uh, a branch of engaged Buddhism, which kind of comes out of the Mahayana tradition um, and, and is particularly sort of um, active in the American context. Um, and, and I'm going to frame this in terms of what I would call being with. Um, Thich Nhat Hanh, a famous writer in, in that tradition, um, says, sorry about the, the lar kind of the large text or small font here, but um, Thich Nhat Hanh says that when we are in harmony with each other, we're also in harmony with the land. We see our close relationship with every person and every species. The happiness and suffering of all humans and all other species is our own happiness and suffering. And so he's calling attention here to two central Buddhist principles, one of, of inter, interconnectedness, right, inter, what he calls interbeing, and then the other um, as suffering and the, the pr primary Buddhist um, goal of, of, you know, of eliminating suffering or um, easing suffering. He says, we inter are, he turns it into, he turns interbeing into a verb, right? We, we inter are, we exist in a kind of continuity, in, in a kind of um, intercon interconnectivity. As practitioners, we see that we are part and not separate from the whole of human civilization. As human beings, we see that we are children of the earth and not separate from the soil, the forests, the rivers, the sky. We share the same destiny. And so Han here is um, right, invoking this idea of interconnectedness, which he, which he kind of spells out elsewhere. Oops. I guess I didn't include that quote, um, which he spells out elsewhere as, uh, he says, you know, when I touch a flower, I'm touching the cloud and touching the rain. This is not just poetry, it's reality. If we take the clouds and the rain out of the flower, the flower will not be there. With the eyes of the Buddha, we're able to see the clouds and the rain in the flower. Being really means interbeing. So, invites people to, uh, to, to practicing kind of non-discrimination when it comes to, um, to the interconnections among various, various beings and various things. And then finally, um, the, the Buddhist tradition, right, I think 
does tend to kind of unite around the insight that um, in various ways, at least in this Mahayana tradition, that um, if we try to dominate or oppress nature, it will, re it will rebel. Um, that we require a fuller understanding of nature. Typhoons, tornadoes, droughts, floods, volcanic eruptions, um, all of these present a danger to life. And so in working out of that insight, Han also says we can largely prevent the destruction that natural disasters cause by working with the land from the beginning and making plans and building decisions that take into account the nature of the land instead of trying to impose complete control over it with dams and deforestations and other other devices and policies that in the end cause more damage so obviously there's some there's some um, there's some uh, compatibility among these these views that I've presented so far um, but also some some interesting differences they have obviously within their own context they have very different um, different uh, sort of uh, foundations and then ending points, but they do share this, this perspective. I'm going to turn to Judaism, and I feel, I, I, I'm aware of just how, in some ways, how impossible this is. Like, I'm running through these different, um, these different quotes and different voices and different traditions, but hopefully what, what is taking shape, what, that something is taking shape through this, these juxtapositions of these different voices, and I'll try to crystallize that kind of toward the end. Um, I should check and see how much time I have. I think, that we're, I think we're okay. Um, so I'm going to turn toward the Jewish tradition, and um, the Jewish tradition in the United States, it, my focus is going to be particularly on, um, on the Jewish tradition in the United States and the, the Jewish renewal movement tied to figures like Martin Buber, Abraham Joshua Heschel, if you want to learn more about those figures, for sure take a class with Dr. Merkel. Um, he, knows, he knows a lot more about them than I do. Um, but out of that renewal movement in the last half of the 20th century, there has emerged a kind of a kind of ecological Judaism um, that includes various figures uh, like Arthur Waskow and Arthur Green, um, the emergence of a of a new um, understanding of what's known as eco kosher um, or uh, Torah Chaim, which literally means the, like the Torah of life. Organizations like like Teva, which is a, a, a very large national Jewish ecological organization. And also Shomrei Adama, which means keepers of the land. Um, all, all of these are very robust national Jewish movement trying to um, trying to turn the, the to the sources, but then turn the sources back into the question about um, what does it mean to live well as a Jewish person, right? As a as an observer of Torah, in the context of ecological disruption and in the context of ecological. Um, uh, you know, disaster. And um, in in that tradition, right, we have to understand. I think that the that the, the Jewish legal tradition, right, requires that one carefully weighs the ramifications of all actions and behavior for every interaction with the natural world. It also sets priorities and weighs conflicting interest in permanent modification of the environment. So here, Chava. So Rose Samuelson, who's a, a well-known writer on sort of Judaism and ecology, um, she's she's trying to what she's suggesting here is that the that the central practice of Jewish life, which is right the observance of Torah, is needs to be fully understood with respect not only to those kinds of um, observances that have to do with uh, matters of moral or uh, ritual purity things like that, but also have to do with questions of ecological integrity. She's trying to Trying to put those things together, and in fact, I would argue that what what um, she and other Jewish thinkers like her are doing is actually attempting to reclaim something for for contemporary Judaism that actually runs deep within the tradition, and is actually an ancient impulse that you can find also in running throughout the biblical text and the biblical tradition. Um, so, to give to give you an example, the rabbis, the early rabbis, prohibited raising sheep and goats that graze even though they were aware that these animals generated a very profitable business in the Roman Empire. And so um, the ban on, raise, on raising these animals was imposed after the devastation of Judea in the, during the, Roman, uh, the um, Bar Kokhba revolt in the second century. And the reason for the ban was to, in order, uh, to, to enable the land to heal from the devastation of war. So short-term hardship right, was traded with long-term gains. Um, 
and so we see at a very early stage, like this is this is embedded within the rabbinic understanding of scriptural texts. So environmental legislation, right, was legitimated by appeal to the holiness of the land, but it also indicates attention to its particular physical conditions at any given moment. So um, I would also argue and add to this that the Bible and subsequent Jewish tradition demonstrate a keen sensibility regarding biodiversity, especially in their careful attention to seeds and agricultural laws. The Mishnah, Judaism's foundational oral Torah, dedicates an entire order of tractates to these issues, ostensibly even though by the time the Mishnah was compiled, the Jewish diaspora was already well underway. In other words, um, even though at that time the Jewish people had, be, had become uh, landless in, 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 a, in several important respects, um, they carried with them, in the form of their oral tradition, a very vast and complex series of, uh, like, you know, set of legislation that was meant to attend to um, how one uses seeds and what does what one does with the land. Um, I think probably all of this, both the Torah and the, and the rabbinic tradition, um, the prophetic literature, to be sure, um, probably you know, it has something to do with the fact that, um, or with the notion that uh, we find a sensibility there that if the people abuse the land by not understanding it and not working within its own internal dynamics, the land would reject them. That, that is, a, that is a, a, a notion that runs throughout, um, throughout the biblical tradition. So perhaps the most salient dimension of Jewish ecological ethics is the causal connection between the moral quality of human life and the vitality of God's creation. The corruption of society is closely linked to the corruption of nature. The injustices arise from human greed and the failure of human beings to protect the order of creation. And thus, parts of the land's produce are to be given to those who do not own land. And by observing the commandments, including letting the land rest, the soil itself becomes holy, and the person who obeys these commandments ensures moral purity necessary for dwelling in God's land. And that's a, that's a kind of a summary version of what, what, um, what some might call a kind of eco-kosher understanding of the tradition. I'll end with one, one, more, um, one more quotation from, um, from one of my favorite writers, a guy named Michael Fishbane, who wrote a beautiful book called The Sacred Attunement, where, where he talks about um, the, the What it, what it is that, that, the, that the Jewish tradition offers in terms of a way of seeing the world. And he's talking about this, what he calls the Torah Kalula, which literally means like the Torah of all in all. And it's his way of talking about the, um, the, the kind of the, the Torah or the teaching that stands behind all of creation and, 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 is the, and sort of infuses the created world with its wisdom, with its, with its order, with its... Um, with its understanding. And so he says that the common that common labor is the moral impetus of the Torah Kalula, focused on futurity and fulfillment, but never enacted in the here and now. From a theological perspective, this impetus is also to be conjoined with a spiritual valence that strives to see ever more of emergent world being in terms of God's all-shaping effectivity. This involves a spiritual revaluation of the everyday, a hearing of the covenant call to attention and attentiveness in and through all things. And elsewhere in the book, he paints a really beautiful picture of what that kind of attentiveness to the integrity of the world really begins to look like. Let's turn to the, to the Christian tradition, and, I, and, and, and I'll, I'll talk about a text that I think is probably familiar, at least to some of you. Um, and again, keeping in mind that there's, there's no way that I can talk about like Christianity, just in the same way that I couldn't talk about Judaism or Buddhism, uh, but I'm providing examples that, that put in conversation with each other, hopefully something begins to emerge from, from that juxtaposition. Um, this is from, um, from a recent, the most recent papal encyclical called Laudato Si. Any, how many of you have read that? I know that some of you have read it. Um, good, okay, so a fair amount of you have read it. Um, Laudato Si, which is, uh, is being called a, you know, the ecological encyclical um, and um, has had a really interesting but so somewhat mixed reception, particularly in the United States. 
I, I myself think, we can maybe talk about this more, but I myself think that um, the reception of Laudato Si in the United States tells us more about the United States than it tells us about Laudato Si. That's my own view. Um, if you want to know more about what I think about that, I can, I can elaborate. Um, but uh, of course, the Catholic tradition has long taught that ecological and economic conditions go hand in hand. Um, this encyclical says as much or more about the plight of the poor as it does about the environment. Teaching about the principle of subsidiarity, which holds that decision making and working toward the common good must be exercised at the lowest levels of political and economic power possible. This includes, and by the way, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just stop on that point for a moment because the, the principle of subsidiarity in Catholic social teaching um, is, is really an important one. And, and here, Pope Francis is using it to speak to environmental questions. And, and subsidiarity is, 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 to some extent, at least my reading of it, and there are maybe theologians in the room that would, um, that would you know, maybe want to get into an argument about this, but my reading of that is that, um, that especially when it, maybe it comes to right, social and ecological issues, if, if problems are not being addressed first and foremost at the local or regional level, then, then in come the managers, right? In come the centralized um, problem solvers, and right, or start solving problems that maybe aren't actually <laughs> um, right, going to be solved very well in terms of the life of the local community and its, and its ecological integrity. Um, a paradox, maybe, right, that the most centralized, largest religious institution in the world teaches something like subsidiarity, but it does. Um, and uh, that's a bit of an aside. But the, the um, right, subsidiarity includes environmental decision making, for which the sake of both justice and resilience must include the most vulnerable members of society. And um, what you know, Pope Francis says is, uh, he says, the mindset which leaves no room for sincere concern for the environment is the same mindset which lacks concern for the inclusion of the most vulnerable members of society. For the current model, with its emphasis on success and self-reliance, does not appear to favor an investment in efforts to help the slow, the weak, or the less talented to find opportunities in life. That's actually a quotation from a different apostolic exhortation. The language is a little strange there. What is needed is a politics which is far-sighted and capable of a new integral and interdisciplinary approach to handling the different aspects of the crisis. A strategy for real change calls for rethinking processes in their entirety, for it is not enough to include a few superficial ecological considerations while failing to question the logic which underlies present day culture. If someone has not learned to stop and admire something beautiful, we should not be surprised if he or she treats everything as an object to be used and abused without scruple. If we want to bring about deep change, we need to realize that certain mindsets really do influence our behavior. Our efforts at education will be inadequate and ineffectual unless we strive to promote a new way of thinking about human beings, life, society, and our relationship with nature. And so what I want to emphasize there is the, right, the, the call to, to a kind of renewed culture, right? To, to, a, to a new, uh, what he actually calls in, in the encyclical, an ecological conversion. He uses the language of conversion to, to speak to what, what he thinks we need. Um, and also to call attention to um, the, the intersections or the, the, right, the, 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 the insight that environmental problems are also always social problems, right? And that they're, and that they're, they're also always in, uh, in, uh, economic problems. And so environmental justice, right, social justice issues often go hand in hand. The plight of the poor, he says, uh, is connected to the plight of the earth. It's interesting, but again, one more quick comment, sort of side comment, um, which is that some observers have, right, have said that, um, that this pope is more aligned with a tradition, a, a Catholic tradition, that has become you know, beyond Catholicism, but of, of liberation theology. And this is the kind of language that one finds in, um, in liberation theology. Um, 
And so to track that, I think, is also kind of an in interesting and important thing. But it also probably speaks to uh, why, why the reception of this encyclical and maybe of the Pope's agenda more broadly has been um, mixed in, in a culture like ours. He's not, I mean, he's not really, he's not saying, hey, you guys are doing great. Keep going. You're doing it. And, you know, congrats. <laughs> Way to go. He's, uh, he's issuing a kind of prophetic word about, um, about, about, our, about our culture. I'm going to uh, say, I'll, I'll speak to one more tradition, which, um, which is, um, the final one is the Islamic tradition. Or, or, and, and here it's, it's interesting because um, what I see, right, as a, as a scholar of religion, what I see is that in, in the Islamic world, in Islamic teaching, there's a, there's a very deep and wonderful way of understanding um, of the, the natural world. But it, it does rest very much on a kind of stewardship model of, um, I, I don't mean that as a but, it rests on a very you know, stewardship model of understanding the relationship between human beings and the natural world. Um, and there's, there's um, perhaps because um, there's a, the, the, both the Quran and the Hadith do not, do not say a lot about ecological sorts of questions. The, um, the, the ways in which ecological concerns have sort of worked themselves out within the context of Muslim communities around the world and also in the United States um, is that, that there tends to be a fair amount of local and local variation and community variation. So if there's a, um, so in other words, so it's not as if you can't derive from reading the Islamic sources a deep and abiding commitment to seeing the, the world as, like, as God's creation and seeing human beings as in the service of stewarding God's creation. That's, that's all there. It runs deep. But like what that actually looks like right, as a sort of program for, um, for ecological uh, work like within Islamic communities, that's, that's something that I think ends up looking a little bit more uh, complicated. And so in some ways, I don't feel confident to really speak to that question. But there are, there are voices within the Muslim communities in the United States in particular who are attempting to not, not just kind of return to the sources and bring those sources to bear on environmental questions, but they're attempting to, um, to kind of create a, a way of understanding Islam that, right, that, is, uh, that is ecologically minded. Um, but again, I think the, the, the reception, as far as I can tell, as someone who studies Islam for, from the outside, Right, as far as I can tell, the reception of that has been somewhat mixed. Here's an example of one, um, one writer, one person who's actually done a lot of work also as a kind of activist working with North American Muslim communities to try to, to, try to like green, you know, green Islam. And he wrote a book called Green Deen, and Deen means, means it's like religion, close, close approximation. So he's asking, what does it look like to, to green Islam? And he says this about, um, about greening, greening mosques. He says, in the spirit of providing for all our brothers and sisters, regardless of what social or economic status they are in, we need to organize our mosques so that the community moves collectively toward justice in their dealings with one another and the natural world. We can build mosques that train congregants to see themselves as part of the oneness of Allah and his creation. OK, of God and his creation. So. Um, so here, I want to call attention to the fact that within the Islamic tradition, the, there is also that, that careful attention to questions of justice, which have, in, in the tradition, again, as I understand it, have been focused primarily on questions of human justice. And now there are, there are thinkers who are attempting, scholars who are attempting to bring that conversation over into questions of, of, of environmental justice as well and to link them, but that there remains much, much work to be done there. Um, so there are running through these different examples that I've given, these different voices that I've given. There are a few themes that I just want to highlight and then I'll close. One of them is, is being, being in place, understanding where you are. And that, that includes having some understanding of, of the watershed in which you live, if you want to put it in that language, right? Or of the, um, the, the, the ecosystem, the 
ecosystemic context that you're in. Another is the possibility of a new kind of orientation or respect toward, um, toward other living beings, right? And not only respecting their, their sort of ecosystem services, right, to use a sustainability word, um, but, but, right, but respecting their, their, their integrity of their life, right, and respecting their, um, their own intrinsic value, right, um, as, as members of an ecosystem. That's the second part. Um, another, another part, another thing that runs through these different examples is also the question of justice. And what does it look like to do, to do justice, right? Um, to, do, to, to, to realize in, in the communities that we live in, right, that, um, that questions of, of environmental sustainability are, are never going to be disconnected from questions of, of um, poverty, systemic, Injustice, um, you know, distributive patterns, like these are all these are all going to be connected issues, and so if we um, if we attend to those as issues of justice, then that that reorients how we think about something like sustainability, and I would argue it, it, it aligns us a little bit more with with a resilience way of thinking, that in the face of the kinds of um, the kinds of disruptions that we're starting to see. Maybe not, maybe not right here in this community. Maybe not, uh, you know, uh, right, you know, right where I live, right, right in front of me. But we're starting to see this, right? Communities facing different kinds of ecological disruptions that are also connected to uh, these other issues that I've called attention to. So if we start to think in terms of resilience, we're starting to think in terms of that broader whole, that broader, the integrity of that, that broader community. Um, that includes the members of uh, both um, other species, but also includes the, the lowest among us, right? The, the ones with the least power and the, the lowest voice or the, the, the quietest voice. So um, I've got maybe just a couple, a couple of concluding thoughts. So briefly demonstrated, I hope that these religious communities and traditions carry with them some tools for thinking about social and environmental questions. Now I want to ask, um, in the interest of both interfaith cooperation and social and environmental questions, or, or uh, social and environmental resilience, I want to ask, what would it look like for these communities to work together in a real way to build practices of resilience? And what would it look like for secular and scientifically-minded environmentalists to engage seriously together with them? This might lay a foundation not only for pragmatic kind of civic engagement, but also make possible a life that is both resilient and even flourishing. Thank you. I knew he could respond creatively to that tall order. You've given us such a wealth of insight to ponder. Uh, 